Hello and welcome back. This video lecture is about flows and pressures in the human cardiovascular system. So the intent is to give you a first look from a big picture perspective, looking at the pressures and flows coming into and out of the heart and at how the vascular system as a whole interacts with the pumping of the heart. Just a reminder, blood flows into the right side of the heart via the superior and the inferior vena cava, uh, which are fed by the systemic vascular beds. Systemic vascular beds, those are all the vessels of the body with the exception of the lungs. So the right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs. Blood flows back from the lungs, returning via the pulmonary veins. You can see the left uh, side pulmonary veins here into the left side of the heart. Blood is pumped from the left ventricle out through, out through the aorta to the systemic circulation. Because that's all is illustrated here schematically. The, the left side of the heart pumping blood out to the body, blood returning to the right side of the heart where it's pumped to the lungs, blood returning from the lungs to the left side. So we're going to further simplify this schematic by lumping together the heart and the lungs like so in this diagram. So in this view, blood is pumped from the left side of the heart to the body, it returns to the heart and lungs before it's pumped out again. So this diagram might seem like an oversimplification, but there's nothing incorrect about it. It just hides some of the detail from this diagram over here um, to focus on these two systems in this diagram, the heart and the lungs acting as, as one lumped system and the systemic vasculature acting as the other system. Okay, now, so why is it useful to think about things like that? Well, we, we want to start thinking about uh, the relationships between the flow through this circuit and the pressures here and here. So the flow, as you might recall, is called the cardiac output. And the pressures are the aortic pressure and the vena cava pressure. And so for now, we're not going to worry about systole and diastole. So we're going to just think in terms of average pressures. The average aortic pressure is around 100 millimeters of mercury. That's averaged over the cardiac cycle. Okay. So here's a plot of the relationships between cardiac output and those pressures. Okay, so, so first off, let's just look at the solid lines. This one is the aortic pressure. This one is the vena cava pressure. Okay, so or instead of vena cava pressure, we could equivalently think about it as the right atrial pressure. So those pressures are similar and they go up and down together. So how do we make sense out of all of this? So first of all, recall that flow is driven by a difference in pressure. So if the cardiac output is not zero, so there's some non-zero cardiac output, non-zero flow, that has to be driven by an arterial or an aortic pressure that's higher than the venous pressure. So in fact, these straight lines here, these solid lines indicate that the total peripheral resistance, the TPR, is constant. That's because the pressure difference is equal to the cardiac output times the total peripheral resistance. So what this equation is saying is that the cardiac output and the pressure difference are proportional. The higher the cardiac output, the greater the pre pressure difference. Okay, so that's so, so because the, the TPR, the total peripheral resistance, is constant, the difference between the aortic and the vena cava pressure is increasing in proportion to increasing flow. Right, so if we, if, if we look at a uh, cardiac output of, of at 2.5 and, and we compare that to a cardiac output of 5, the pressure difference is twice as great at 5 as it is at 2.5. Right? Okay, so the, the, in, in that case, the resistance is constant. That's a constant proportionality. We double the flow, we double the pressure gradient, or double the pressure gradient, double the flow. Okay. Now, in this graph, for a normal sort of cardiac output of around 5 liters per minute, we have a normal sort of pressure, uh, aortic pressure of around 100. Okay, venous pressure of around 5 uh, millimeters of mercury. Now it's, it's conceptually important to realize that these curves here have nothing to do with the heart. Okay, they're telling us about how the vasculature behaves. We could replace the heart and the lungs with an electric pump, okay, hooked up to the um, vena cava, vena cavas, and the aorta. And this is the sort of, you know, gross behavior of the system that, that we would expect to observe. Okay, so hopefully it makes sense that as we increase the pump rate, the outlet pressure increases and the inlet pressure decreases. That's what this plot shows, okay? The outlet pressure is the aortic pressure. The inlet pressure is the venous pressure. I mean, outlet and inlet to the pump. The pump is the, is the, is the heart and lungs, okay? 
Um, we also see that the outlet pressure, the arterial pressure, changes much more steeply than the inlet pressure curve or the venous pressure curve. The difference in these slopes is due to the difference in stiffness of arteries versus veins. So when flow increases, for example, um, you're shifting volume from the venous side to the arterial side. Okay, And for a given change of volume, causes a bigger increase in arterial pressure than a corresponding decrease in, in, in volume on the venous side because the arteries are stiffer than the veins. So that's why the, that, that's the, 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 the difference in these slopes. Okay, so I think this might look simple, but I think maybe deceptively simple, right? It's just a couple of straight lines, but I really encourage you to stop and, and think about this, pause the video, rewind it, whatever. These concepts are important. Right? And, and actually, I want to give you a thought, a, um, a, a thought experiment. Okay, what happens if we increase arterial resistance? Okay, the curves do this. Why do the curves do that? I'm going to ask you to pause the video, think about it, see if you can sort it out, and then come back and, and, and we'll go through the explanation. Okay, did you pause the video? Did you, did, you, did you work it out? Does it all make sense? So first of all, if there's no flow, there's no pressure drop. Okay, that's this point here. Okay, remember, flow in the vessels is driven by a pressure difference. So changing the resistance does not change the fact that when the flow is zero, the pressure difference is zero. Okay, when the pressure difference is zero, flow is zero. Okay, fine. Now, if we increase the resistance, then at a given flow, the pressure difference is increased. And that's what these dashed lines are showing. Make sense? Okay, here on the left, the same plot we just looked at. Here on the right, looking at the same stuff again in a slightly different way. First of all, we're zoomed in on the venous curve, this part down here. And the second thing, I flipped the axes. Okay, the reason, so, so now the, the, I, I, the reason for switching the axes will become apparent later on. For now, it's a potential source of confusion, but just bear with me. Um, so if we look, the cardiac output is now on the, y-axis on, on this graph on the right, and the pressures are on the x-axis, okay? But we have the same thing. As cardiac output increases, that causes venous pressure to go down. As cardiac output goes down, venous pressure is increasing. Another way to think about this, again, is to think about the heart as an artificial pump, okay? If the pump is not working well, its output is low, then fluid is expected to build up on the inlet side of the pump. The inlet side is the venous side, okay? Decrease Decreased cardiac output causes venous pressures to increase. That's what this curve says. Okay, so by the way, this curve is sometimes called the vascular function curve. Um, um, and here's, here's that effect of the increase in arterial resistance. Just like we saw in this plot, increasing resistance makes the venous pressure drop at a given cardiac output. Okay, so what if we were to constrict the veins? Constricting the veins leads to an increase in venous pressure, and that is shown here. So now let's do some exercises to make sure that we understand this stuff. So, okay, without looking back, I want you to sketch what happens to this relationship when the arterial resistance changes. Pause the video, take your time. And okay, we're back. Uh, let's go through this exercise. So remember, venous pressure is going down with cardiac output. If we increase resistance, the rate at which it goes down increases something like this, right? So similarly, if we decrease resistance, that means arterial vascular beds are vasodilated, the curve goes this way. Now, another way to think about this is to ask yourself what vasodilation tends to do to cardiac output. If vascular beds are dilated, resistance goes down, cardiac output tends to go up this way. If the opposite happens, arterial vascular beds are constricted, resistance goes up, opposing cardiac output, things go this way. Here's another exercise. Sketch what happens to this relationship when the venous tone changes. Okay, that is smooth muscle in the large veins is contracting, causing the veins to be stiffer and to squeeze against the blood. Okay, so pause the video, don't look back, try to work this one out on your own. Okay, we're back. So if you increase venous tone, 
Like I said, smooth muscle is squeezing the veins. You make them less compliant, more stiff. So venous pressure increases, the curve shifts this way. So if you were to decrease the venous tone, the opposite happens. Actually, one more exercise. Hopefully these are helping you get the hang of, of what's going on here. So what happens to this relationship when blood volume changes? Pause the video, come back when you figured it out. Welcome back. Okay, so what happens to this relationship when blood volume changes? Well, if we put more blood volume into the system, there's more volume in the veins, pressure increases, something like this happens. So this is equivalent to increasing the venous tone. By increasing the blood volume or stretching the veins, making the walls of the vessel squeeze down more, raising the pressure. So that's equivalent to increasing the, the, the pressure by increasing the smooth muscle tone in the wall of the veins. What about decreasing the blood volume? Right? So say an acute injury, a patient is hemorrhaging, okay? the curves are going to shift this way. Okay, now, so far this has all been about the gross properties and function of the systemic vasculature. Let's switch gears for a minute and talk about the heart. So I've already mentioned in a previous video this thing called the Frank Starling mechanism. The Frank Starling mechanism says that the greater the volume of blood that fills the ventricle during diastole, the greater the force of contraction and subsequent ejection of blood from the ventricle during systole. So the amount of filling is called preload. Okay, and as preload goes, preload goes up with right atrial pressure because right atrial pressure is what drives the filling. So we can plot the Frank Starling mechanism like this. Stroke volume increases with increasing filling pressure, or increasing preload. So if stroke volume goes up with preload, cardiac output goes up because cardiac output is stroke volume times the heart rate. So we can think about the Frank Starling mechanism in terms of, of stroke volume, or we can think about it in terms of cardiac output. Okay, now here, um, we're not gonna talk about the molecular mechanism that underlies the Frank Starling mechanism. That's discussed in a, in a different lecture. Okay, but even without worrying about the molecular details of what is happening in the muscle cells of the heart, it makes sense that the output of the pump increases with filling of the pump. At least in the limit of no filling or very low preload, um, you would not expect there to be much pumping capacity. And, and essentially that's what the Frank Starling mechanism is saying. And the reason we talk about the Frank Starling mechanism and the vascular function curve at the same time is that we can put them both on the same plot. And this is why we made that confusing switch of the X and the Y axes on the vascular function curve. Right, so we put them, putting them together helps us to think about how the heart and the vasculature work together. That's what we're doing here. So, so um, before we, we go any further, I want to remind you that we're um, looking at the heart and the vasculature in this very coarse level. Right, so the view from 35,000 feet. So, you know, here I'm showing a more detailed representation of the systemic and pulmonary vascular beds to remind you of all the things that we're lumping together into this simple representation. Okay, fine, but even, even with this simple representation, we can get a handle on some useful concepts, and that's, that's, why, we're, that's why we're doing it. Later on, we'll break this thing um, uh, down into more detail. Okay, so remember, the vascular function curve is a property of the systemic vasculature. The Frank Starling curve is a property of the pump, okay? In this view, the pump is the combined both chambers of both sides of the heart and, and the lungs are combined in the pump. So what these curves, where these curves meet is where the system is operating, right? Okay, simple, I guess. What can you do with this kind of a tool? Well, for one thing, uh, th these curves help us to understand exercise. So in exercise, two things are happening in terms of what we can represent here. So one of the things that hap is happening is that the arterial resistance goes down in exercise. So peripheral vascular beds are dilating to recruit increased flow to meet the demands of, of the exercising muscle. Okay, that's what, that is what is happening here, right? So on the left, um, we're showing how an increase in resistance leads to a drop in feeling pressure at a given cardiac output. So remember that? So here, the opposite is happening. A decrease in resistance is leading to an increase in feeling pressure at a given cardiac output. Um, the changes in, in, in the, the, 
changes in the curve gives us a new operating point, which would be here. Okay. The other thing that happens, as you've probably experienced, when you um, recruit, recruit increased flow and exercise, your heart rate increases to help maintain arterial pressure and to meet the flow demand. So that change is mediated largely through the barrel reflex, which we'll learn about later. In addition to an increase in heart rate, the heart contractility also increases, and we'll see later how that works as well. So both of these effects, a, a rate increase and a contractility increase, magnify the Frank Starling curve like this. So the combined effects on the Frank Starling curve and the vascular function curve both work together to increase cardiac output. So this example represents mild increase, mild exercise, because we're only recruiting something like a 50% increase in, in output. So maybe that's um, this is an example of something like taking a, a stroll, okay, or or, or a walk. Um, you might play around with these curves to think about how they might look in vigorous exercise. How much does the resistance change? And how much does the Frank Starling curve change in order to recruit, you know, several fold increase in cardiac output? So these relationships also help us to understand disease. Heart failure, for example, is something you will hear a lot more about. In heart failure, the contractility of the heart is generally impaired, which is reflected here by a diminished Frank Starling curve. And you can see how that would lead to a reduced cardiac output and a buildup of pressure at the inlet to the pump, an increase in, in venous pressure or, or right atrial pressure. So one of the things that the body does in response to a failing heart is to build up blood volume and or to increase venous vasoconstriction through the action of catecholamines and possibly the renin angiotensin system. So that increase in venous, in, in venous uh, constriction and or total blood volume is accounted for, as we've already seen, with a change like this in the vascular function curve. So that change um, is compensatory, okay, in that it leads to helping to maintain cardiac output by increasing preload, but at the cost of an increased venous pressure. Okay? So there are deleterious consequences of this compensation that you'll be finding out much more about um, later on.